Online dating can be a minefield at the best of times. After all, when it comes to meeting strangers on the internet, can you ever truly know who you're interacting with, laughing with, planning to meet up with? Someone who learned that the answer to that question is a resounding no is Runa Tamura, a young Japanese woman who just this year fell victim to the strangest case of catfishing I've ever come across. But as the person on the other end of the screen came to realise, Runa wasn't the type of person who took being double-crossed lightly. In fact, she took it deadly seriously. Join me as we explore what's arguably this year's most bizarre case, one involving manipulation, CCTV evidence, love hotels, and personal vendettas. This is the story of Japan's darkest romance. The festive season is upon us, and as well as buying presents for my nearest and dearest, I'm also drawing up a wish list of my own. A good practice, seeing how I always leave things off that would really come in handy for making YouTube videos. Speaking of which, you may have forgotten to add something to your wish list. Today's sponsor, Stamps.com, your personal online post office. Stamps have been helping businesses like yours save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years, with easy access to USPS and UPS services, and premium rates for all of your postage needs. Their service allows you to print postage and shipping labels in seconds from wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. Stamps really makes taking care of orders a breeze, and recently things have gotten even easier with the Stamps.com mobile app. If you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule one through your Stamps.com dashboard. Running low? Order shipping and mailing supplies, labels, and even printers from the supply store. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. But my favourite thing about Stamps has to be all of the amazing savings. We're talking 84% off USPS and UPS rates to help your bottom line. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. With the holidays just around the corner, give your business the gift of Stamps.com. Sign up at Stamps.com forward slash Lazy Masquerade for a special offer that includes a four week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com forward slash Lazy Masquerade. Sapporo, the largest city in Hokkaido, Japan's northernmost prefecture. A beautiful area renowned for its serene landscapes and snowy winters. It has such a tranquil and relaxing reputation that my wife and I actually went there on our honeymoon. It's a great place to enjoy some winter sports, go for walks in nature, or just enjoy the city's vibrant and varied attractions. And with an extremely low crime rate, all of that can be enjoyed with near complete peace of mind. But if this case teaches us anything, it's that even the most peaceful places have their dark sides. Two people who called Sapporo home were Osamu and Hiroko Tamura. In 1994, they had a child together who immediately became their pride and joy, a daughter who they named Luna. Growing up, Luna had always found it difficult to come out of her shell, and since kids can be cruel, her quiet nature caught the attention of school bullies. Following the example of the loudest and most malicious, many of Luna's peers began making fun of her on a daily basis, calling her names and saying that she looked like a cartoon character. For the most part, Luna internalised her anger. But everyone has their limits. On one occasion, after being insulted, she chased a male classmate with a box cutter, fully intending to slice him to pieces before she was finally restrained. Though she was able to regain her composure, she later approached that same classmate and announced, If you do that again, I'll kill you. Those words became a mantra that she lived by. From then on, the other students no longer made fun of her. They completely avoided her, terrified of how she might retaliate if they got on her bad side. That incident had taught Luna one thing, that it was better to be feared than to fear others. Given that her formative years were plagued with torment and isolation, Luna became a reclusive girl, one who grew up into a reclusive young woman. For obvious reasons, she found it difficult to form friendships and relationships. Her parents, 59-year-old Osamu and 60-year-old Hiroko, did their best to support Luna. They took her out of the school system which she loathed so much, and paid for the best psychiatric treatment money could buy to help with any issues that she may have developed. 
One suggested that she may suffer from Gamutlos psychopathy, which nowadays people generally call antisocial personality disorder. According to those who knew them, Luna's parents had a daughter-first attitude. Her father was a prominent and successful psychiatric doctor himself, and he used his wealth to shower Luna in gifts and make her feel loved. Both parents doted on her hand and foot, catered to her every desire, even followed her rules. In many ways, Luna had the run of their four-story luxury house, a house which she rarely left. I've seen some articles refer to her as a hikikomori, a shut-in who withdraws from society. Indeed, Luna would whittle her days away on the internet, posting on forums about her hatred of men. After all, it had always been the boys tormenting her at school, and she carried those memories with her into adulthood. It was in 2023 that Runa, now 29 years old, began attempting to socialise more with others in online chat rooms. It was on one such site that she met Tomo, a fellow lesbian looking for a companion. Runa and Tomo really hit it off, and would spend hours chatting online about anything and everything. Eventually, they agreed to meet in person at a disco night in Sapporo's nightlife district, Susukino. But there was one problem. Tomo wasn't who she claimed to be. She was Hiroshi Una, a 62-year-old man who created a female persona to meet and hook up with women. It was a secret he kept from everyone, including his wife and children. After all, Hiroshi had a reputation to maintain. He was a dedicated company employee, a mild-mannered and well-respected member of his local community, your typical family man. But secretly, Hiroshi would spend many a night at bars and clubs, convincing his wife that his boss was hosting a nomikai, that is, after-work drinks with co-workers. Since it was his boss, they were offers he couldn't refuse. Really though, Hiroshi was leading a double life, one as his alter ego, who was well known in Susakino, Tomo-chan. And despite being older than her father, Hiroshi had made use of makeup and filters to convince Runa that he was a much younger woman. To be clear, because this is a sensitive topic, Hiroshi didn't identify as a woman or as trans. By all accounts, he did enjoy dressing up as Tomo-chan, but considered it a hobby and not part of his gender identity. But according to those whom Hiroshi frequently partied and socialised with, he didn't go out dressed as Tomo-chan just for his own pleasure. He also found that it had strategic benefits. As Tomo-chan, women viewed him as less threatening and would let their guards down around him. Crucially, they were more likely to hang out with him one-on-one. -on -one. Occasionally, he'd even get one to come back to a hotel with him. On a more sinister note, Hiroshi had been barred from many a night spot for taking advantage of female patrons while they were drunk or passed out. He never faced any serious repercussions for those actions though. Japan is, after all, notoriously bad when it comes to prosecuting cases of SA. Even during daylight hours, Hiroshi still had something of a reputation. He'd been kicked out of several bathhouses for being a wani, or crocodile, the word used for those who spy on patrons of the opposite sex as they bathe in onsen. A former contact of Hiroshi's, known as Mr. Sato, has since testified. The first place I met Hiroshi was at a mixed onsen in Kitayuzawa. It's a hot spring along the river, where families and ordinary people go, but it's a famous spot for crocodiles. There was a culture there where male customers would secretly watch women bathe. Hiroshi was a regular. In late May of this year, Luna and Hiroshi, or perhaps I should say Tomo, met in person at the nightclub. These images, captured inside the venue, show Luna and Tomo having a good time, hugging, smiling, dancing, and seemingly being very flirtatious. At this point, it's believed that Luna still had no idea that Tomo was actually Hiroshi. After all, the room was dark, and she very rarely interacted with men, other than her father, Osamu that is. Speaking of Osamu, he too was at the club that same night. Given that she rarely left the house or interacted with strangers, Luna had likely asked him to come along for moral support, though it appears she also asked him to stay out of the way, as these images, taken within the venue that same night, show him wandering around aimlessly by himself while also keeping an eye on his daughter. After a few hours, Luna left the venue with her dad 
but stayed in touch with Hiroshi online. Hiroshi even sent a text to his friends, saying that he had met a great girl and that they were now dating. On their second meeting in mid-June, Hiroshi took Runa out for dinner, yet again in Susukino. It's unknown what exactly transpired that evening. Some reports say that Hiroshi forced himself upon Runa when they were alone. Others state that he raped her and filmed the entire ordeal on his phone. Others still say that he merely revealed he was actually a man and confessed his love for her. What we do know is that Runa learned of Hiroshi's true identity that night, and then returned home and expressed her anger and humiliation to her parents. Osamu contacted Hiroshi directly and warned him to stay away from his daughter and to never message her again. Hiroshi agreed, so long as Osamu agreed not to contact the police. Perhaps thinking that he'd just get let off with a warning anyway, Osamu reluctantly agreed. Unbelievably, just one month later, Hiroshi broke his side of the bargain and messaged Runa, asking to meet with her for a third date. Even more unbelievably, Runa agreed. But that's because she had something other than romance on her mind. Revenge. July 1st, 2023. The date of Hiroshi and Runa's third and final meeting. At 10.50pm, Hiroshi, dressed as Tomo-chan, was seen entering a love hotel with a young woman dressed in white, wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a face mask, seemingly trying to conceal her identity. Such disguises aren't unusual for people booking into Japanese love hotels, where rooms are rented by the hour, and where many people go to cheat on their partners or to have casual flings. At such fine establishments, anonymity and discretion are the name of the game. In fact, the rooms are often soundproofed and devoid of windows, and you can typically pay in cash through a small hole so even the staff can't see your face. Hiroshi had booked them into room 202, otherwise known as the pink room. The pair entered, and Hiroshi made his way into the bathroom to freshen up before they got down to business. As he stood looking in the mirror with his back to the bathroom door, Luna approached him from behind with a video camera in one hand and a sharp blade in the other. She then set about taking his life, while simultaneously making her very own snuff film. After embracing Hiroshi from behind, Runa punctured him several times with the blade, with one stab extending from his collarbone down to his lung. The lack of defensive marks on his arms and hands indicates that the whole attack ended quickly, and Hiroshi likely perished before he even knew what was happening. Following this, Runa took a handsaw and a set of various blades which she had brought with her, and removed Hiroshi's head, wearing a pre-packed raincoat to avoid any splatter. She then proceeded to call the front desk using the hotel room's phone, and inform them that one of the checked-in guests would be leaving, but that the other was going to spend the night. She then left the scene, taking with her Hiroshi's phone, wallet, clothes, and anything else that could be used to identify him, including his head. These images captured just outside of the hotel at approximately 2am, showed Una in a new disguise, carrying her morbid assortment of items in a prepared suitcase and backpack. After exiting the hotel alone, her father, Osamu, pulled up in his car and helped her flee the scene. You see, Luna had actually told her parents that Hiroshi had invited her on a third date, and together, the family planned the perfect murder. Osamu, a trained psychiatrist who worked in a hospital knew his way around the human body, and instructed his daughter on how to remove Hiroshi's head, something she'd have to take with her along with any personal objects to delay identification. On the day of the incident, he bought Luna the saw, backpack and suitcase, and provided her with a blonde wig. The mother, Hiroko, was to wait at home, while Osamu waited outside the hotel until the deed was done. Luna and her father then returned to their home located 10 kilometers away from the scene. They handed Hiroko the bag containing Hiroshi's head. She placed it inside an icebox, which they left in the bathroom. Satisfied that her parents would clean up after her like they always did, Runa then borrowed her dad's car, drove straight back to Susakino, and partied into the early hours at the same club where she had first met Hiroshi. Though the night was still young, this was likely an attempt to build an alibi. In that same vein, Osamu went straight back to work the following day, and acted as if nothing had happened. 
according to all of Osumu's co-workers. He seemed to be in good spirits, and then got on with his work as normal. From the outside at least, he appeared cool as a cucumber, and there was no indication that a human head was in his icebox back home. Hiroko, on the other hand, was less inconspicuous and tight-lipped. On July 2nd, she phoned a relative and told them what had happened, explaining that she didn't think Runa would actually go through with the act. She was wrong. Around that same time, hotel staff went to check on the guest in the pink room, who had failed to check out at the correct hour. Upon entering, they noticed that the bed was still made and hadn't been used, and that there was a foul smell emanating from the bathroom. Inside, they found Hiroshi in a crouching position inside the bathtub. They called out to him, but got no reply. It was only upon closer inspection that they realised he didn't have a head. Investigators were summoned, and they combed the room for evidence, but found no fingerprints at the scene. The body was soon linked to missing family man Hiroshi Una, and an examination of his computer activity led the authorities to their prime suspect, Luna Tamura, the only person that he had made plans with on the night of his demise. Not only that, but Luna lived close to an area where the remains of a cat had recently been found. The cat was missing its head. The discovery had been brought to the authorities' attention, though no culprit had been found. Officers arrived at the Tamara household on July 25th, three weeks after the incident had taken place. They caught Runa, Osamu, and Hiroko completely off guard. According to investigators, the family were evidently hoarders, since there was so little room to manoeuvre inside the home, with piles of boxes in every room, and objects scattered across every square inch of floor. They proceeded to half search and half clean up the home, packing much of the mess away into garbage bags. After some time, they were able to recover all of Hiroshi's missing belongings, including his mobile phone, a device which had been broken, likely to either delete evidence or destroy any videos that Hiroshi himself may have taken. Most disturbingly, they also found Hiroshi's head still on ice inside the family's bathroom. Given that three weeks had passed, it was obviously worse for wear, and certain parts of it were missing. Sections of Hiroshi's skin had been peeled off and hung up like laundry. Detectives also seized videos that had been taken both before and after the slaughter. Although they haven't been released to the public, the one taken inside the family home reportedly shows gloved hands, allegedly Uruna's, playing with Hiroshi's neck and head. Since both her hands are reportedly visible in the clip, and since the camera angle changes, they believe that one of Runa's parents was filming her. It's since been revealed that after the slaying had taken place, but before the story was reported on by the news media, all three family members had searched the term Susakino murder on their smartphones. Runa's collection of over 20 blades was also seized. All three family members were originally taken into custody for damaging, abandoning, and possessing a body, though on August 14th they were also charged with first degree. Upon her arrest, Runa told investigators, There are several personalities inside of me. One of them did this. Suspecting that she may have been coached to say this by her psychiatrist father, Runa and her parents are currently undergoing psychiatric analysis to determine whether they can be held responsible for Hiroshi's slaying. They'll remain in police detention until 2024, when a verdict will be returned about their mental states, and whether they're fit to stand trial. Well, the response to this whole incident online has been… mixed. Though some argue that a premeditated slaying can never be justified, I think I've seen more people sympathising with Runa and her parents. They argue that her revenge was justified and that Osamu and Hiroko were just looking out for their daughter's best interests by taking the law into their own hands. If you ask me though, it's too soon to be jumping to any conclusions, and we should all be careful not to mistake rumours with facts. Since this case is still ongoing, and since all three suspects are remaining tight-lipped as a defence, it's yet to be seen whether this truly was a revenge slaying, or, as some Japanese internet users say, a pleasure kill. Though Hiroshi did have a history of acting inappropriately and forcing himself upon women, in this case there's no concrete proof that he did anything other than mislead Runa about his identity. And even then, 
Some are skeptical that Runa didn't realize Hiroshi was a man in drag when they first met. It is true that she had little interaction with men in the outside world, but she did see plenty of them on TV at home, and her father, Osamu, was also known to dress up as a goth drag queen himself and put on shows with his band around Susukino. That's to say, she knew what a middle-aged man in drag looked like. So did Hiroshi and Runa really fall out because he had tricked her, or did she have another motive to take his life? Whatever the case, this is an extremely bizarre story that I wanted to share with you all today and get your thoughts on. I haven't seen many other YouTubers talking about it, especially in English, so shout out to my wife for bringing it to my attention. When all's said and done, there clearly are still large gaps in the details that the authorities haven't provided, so when new information comes out, I'll be sure to update you all on my social media platforms, or maybe even make another video entirely. Until then, all we can do is put this mystery on ice and speculate. A huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon. Matt Fennell, George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Smilin' Jack, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Nefus1988, Lydia Kumo, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Farewell Tattoos Jack FL, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, Jordan Pri, Monica Mendoza, Peter Lodrach, Ruth V. Kashindi, and TNS Mum. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. The Devils in the Detail.